Okay, whoops, welcome back to part three of our nuclear chemistry discussion. And we're going to start today talking about radioactive dating and a concept called half-life. Probably have heard of this term before. Let's go ahead and define it for you anyway. Half-life um, is the time for half Um, of a radioactive sample to undergo radioactive decay. So the time it takes for one half of a radioactive sample to undergo radioactive decay. Now remember we talked about alpha emission? In fact, let's pull out this paper that we had out during our last discussion. See if I can find it here. Here we go. We talked about uh, plutonium-239 so we'll write, the, we'll write the equation all over again. 239 over 94 plutonium. And we said it gave off an alpha particle in an attempt to stabilize itself. And in the process, it transmutated into 235 uranium with an atomic number of 92. Now that takes some time for that to happen. The time it takes for one half of a sample of this to turn into or transmutate into uranium-235 is called a half-life. Now, a common misconception is that after two half-lives, the radioactive sample will completely disappear when that is not the case. Let's say we begin with 100 grams of pure plutonium-239. After one half-life, we would have 50 grams remaining. The time it takes for that to happen would be the half-life of plutonium-239. Now, some half-lives are measured in microseconds. They're very, very short. Others are measured in billions of years. Now, what if this went through a second half-life? So, half-life number two. How much would remain? Well, the definition is the time for half of it to decay. So if we went from 100 to 50, that's one half-life. If we go from 50 to 25 grams, that would be two half-lives. And two half-lives would take exactly twice the amount of time as one half-life. Now we can continue with this if we'd like. After three half-lives, we would have 12 and a half grams remaining. After four half-lives, you'd have 6. 2.5 grams remaining, and so on, and so on, and so on. So please don't think that after two half-lives, your radioactive sample is gone. It's not the case. Every time you go through a half-life, you have one half remaining from your initial amount uh, at the beginning of the previous half-life. Now let's take a look at the decay series of uranium-238. So uranium-238 decays into thorium-234. Now, for half of that to decay, it takes 4.5 billion years. Isn't that interesting? Now, think about this. Uranium-238, so that has 238 as a mass number. Uranium has an atomic number of 92. Now, thorium has a mass number of 234 with an atomic number of 90. So, once again, we shout out an alpha particle. And it took four and a half billion years for half of this sample to decay into thorium-234. Now, thorium-234 transmutates into Pa. Now, what the heck is Pa? Well, if you take a look, Pa turns out to be protactinium. On the time it takes for one half of a sample of thorium-234 to decay into protactinium-234 is 24 days. Now let's think about this process here. Let's just magnify that a little bit. 234 over 
Let's see, the atomic number of thorium is 90. Oh, let's write the symbol here. I made a little mistake. So that's thorium. Sorry about that. And that will give off, let's see, what type of particle does it give off for it to be able to turn into Pa with the mass number of 234 still? And its atomic number actually goes up by 1. So its atomic number is 91. Hmm, what type of decay process would that be? The mass number stays the same, so the uh, mass of this particle is 0. And what plus 91 equals 90? Now you guessed it, that's a negative 1. So what type of emission process is that? If you said a beta emission, you are correct. So thorium-234 emits a beta particle in becoming protactinium-234. Uh, and then protactinium gives off another beta particle, and that takes uh, 1.2 minutes, it looks like, on this graph, and it becomes uranium-234. So we're back up to an atomic number of 92, but the mass now is only 234. And then uranium-234 transmutates into thorium again with a mass of 230, and that takes 250,000 years for one half of that sample to decay. So maybe we should do this process here. Let's magnify this off to the side. We have uranium-234, its atomic number is 92. What type of particle would it give off to produce thorium with a mass number of 230? Well, thorium's atomic number is 90, as we mentioned earlier. So let's see, we have 92 on the left side. 90 on the right. Looks like we're missing an atomic number of 2 and a mass number of 4. Hmm, 4 over 2. Isn't that an alpha particle? So uranium-234 transmutates into thorium-230 by giving off an alpha particle. And if you take a look at this graph, every time we have one of these diagonal areas, arrows, it's an alpha emission, and every time it's a horizontal area, it turns out to be a beta emission. Eventually, we get all the way down to lead 206, and it says that word underneath it, which is stable, which means we finally have a nucleus that's stable, so it's not going to be emitting any alpha or beta particles any longer. It's a stable nucleus, and that is where it will remain. Now, perhaps the most common half-life that's discussed is that of carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a beta emitter. So let's take a look and see. We'll do the reaction here. Carbon-14. Carbon has an atomic number of 6. Gives off a beta particle. And so what are we going to end up with? Well, this will be an atomic number of 7, which makes it the element nitrogen. And the mass is still 14. Now, for one half of my carbon-14, to decay into nitrogen-14 takes 5,730 years. We can use that as a type of nuclear clock. For instance, let's say I dig up an artifact, and I find that compared to an artifact today, or maybe something that recently died, and I can find the amount of carbon-14 in the old artifact compared to today, and in the old one it has 25% of what would be in something that passed away today, uh, of the same amount of carbon-14. How old is that artifact? Well, let's see how many half-lives it went through. Of course, it began at 100% uh, of what it would have been today. After one half-life, we would have 50% remaining. After two half-lives, we'd have my 25% remaining. So we go through two half-lives. So, 5,730 years per half-life times two half-lives would give me, let's see, 11,460 years old. That would mean that that passed away that many years ago. So we can use this as a nuclear clock to determine how long something has been dead. So, if we found something that uh, we believe to be 10,000 years old, how many half-lives would it have gone through? Well, let's see. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years 
per half-life. So that'd be a little bit less than two half-lives for carbon-14. What percentage of carbon-14 would remain after 25,000 years? And how many half-lives have passed? Well, once again, we are just going to estimate. We're not going to get an exact number here, but we have 5,730 for the first half-life, and then we'd have 5,730 for the second half-life, 5,730 for the third half-life, 5,730 for the fourth half-life. Well, let's take a look and see how many years have passed for four half-lives. 5,730 times four puts me at about 23,000 years. So we're at about 23,000 years. What percentage of that carbon-14 would be remaining? Well, let's see. If we started with 100%, after one half-life, we would have 50%. After two half-lives, we would have 25%. After three half-lives, we're down to 12.5%. And then finally, after four half-lives, we'd have 6.25% of the carbon-14 remaining. Now in class, we're going to talk about the Shroud of Turin, which has been carbon dated. We're going to find out if the Shroud of Turin is uh, a real artifact, as old as some people state it is. By the way, they claim it's the burial cloth of Christ, so that would mean it would have to be about 2,000 years old, or if it is some type of medieval hoax. So I'll teach you how to do that in class. Or you can look it up on Google and find out for yourself. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is a process called nuclear fission. Now, this is the evolution of energy um, through a nuclear fission process. It's directly related to the decrease in mass that takes place in the splitting of more massive fissionable atoms into two less massive atoms. For example, about 80 million kilojoules of energy is given off for every gram of uranium-235 that goes through this fission process. That's equivalent to the explosion of about 30,000 kilograms of TNT. Now that's quite amazing. A gram is about 1 30th of an ounce. And if we can have uranium-235, one gram of that, going through this fission process, it yields about that same amount of energy. And that's what we're going to talk about in our last discussion on nuclear chemistry, will be the nuclear fission process. So that's something for you to look forward to. Thanks.